Welcome back to Scuba Diver Live. We're here again, uh, bringing you a little bit of fun and merriment into your home while we're all sat around with this uh, lockdown for COVID-19. Um, hopefully, it'll be a bit of inspiration for you. It'll educate you a little bit, but hopefully it'll also just give you an hour of fun uh, to while away a bit of time. Um, remember, if you like what we're doing, hit that subscribe button, ring that little bell. You'll get notification so you don't miss out on any future installments. We're on Tuesdays and Fridays at the moment. Um, Leave your comments. We always like to hear what you think of it. Let us know who you'd like to see on future shows, any topics you'd like us to discuss, and we'll do our best to oblige. Um, before I bring on this week's guests, I'd just like to say thank you to our sponsor, MeFlex Hoses. Um, these hoses are great. They're flexible, durable, and they come in all sorts of colors, so you can really stand out from the crowd. So check them out. Their shop's open even during lockdown. Um, so basically, what have we got for you today? We have got two gurus of underwater filmmaking and videography, uh, David Diley and Brian Stanislas. So if I could bring them on. There we go. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Good, good. Hello, how's it going? You all right? Yeah, I can hear, you now. I can hear a word you were saying before. Uh, so how are you surviving uh, in the lockdown period, you guys? Busy. That's what I like uh, to hear. You're not coming through to me. Audio, I can't hear you. Oh, what are you like? Technical issues with the underwater filmmaking experts. I, I'm good. Okay. You're good. Well, we'll go on with you while David's sorting himself out. So, yeah, let's get started straight off the bat is, because everyone likes to know this, is how did you actually get into diving itself? Not the underwater oh. filmmaking side of things, the actual diving side of stuff. Ah, uh, gosh. Uh Years ago, um, I, th I think I was about. Uh, this is in the days when there used to be three channels on television. Um, you had BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV. And it was Saturday morning TV. Mum used to plonk us in the lounge and pretty much um, watch TV while she done the housework on a Saturday morning. And um, it was this man that kicked it all off for me on Saturday morning TV. And I was absolutely infatuated with Jacques Cousteau and his underwater world. Um, and watching the rogue throw dynamite over the side of his boat, Calypso, in order to blow his way into the um, into the shallow bays through the coral. So we uh, were probably a bit on PC back then. But, um, yeah, that's what it all started for me. And I think uh, by the time I was at um, senior school at the age of 13, I was scuba diving. Um, got pressured into it by a good friend of mine, and so sort of like went from there. Really, by the time I was twenty two, twenty three, I'd gone professional. So, yeah, many years ago now. <laughs> oh, we've got David back. Can you hear us now, David? I can hear you now. Yes, I don't know what was going on there before, but sorry about that. Fantastic. It's all right. The old. Uh... Log off and reconnect always does the trick. Um, right, yeah. so all we basically pick up from where Brian just left off. I've just as uh, talk about how you first got into diving itself, not the underwater filmmaking side of things. Actually, how you got started in diving? Well, they're both linked. Um, the reason I got into diving was because I knew what I wanted to do uh, for a career. So it's something I'd always wanted to do since the age of seven. So I knew that in order for me, if I want to film sharks underwater, I've got to learn to dive. It's basically the commute to work. So um, it was always the case of even as a kid, just having a career path laid out. Um, so even when I first started the first day of uh, my open water, I knew it was just the first step to becoming a professional diver. So it wasn't a case of falling into it or anything like that. It was just a case of knowing what I wanted to do, finally being able to afford to do it and then doing it, knowing full well the journey that uh, I had in front of me. Oh, there you go. That's a bit of an unusual one. So that would actually leads into the next question, because that's what I was going to bring in, the um, the shooting underwater. Now, that is a bit odd for people to be that focused, that it was you decided that you wanted to shoot sharks underwater, and so you were just on that path. Yeah. So it, that... it was as simple as that, really. It was just a case of um, I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, so it was, it was always, it was never, it's never been a hobby, uh, for me. I mean, even from, I did my open water course and then from then in 2007, from then up until now, 13 years later, I've done maybe, maybe five dives with that camera in my hand out of probably 1500. It's just, it's always, always had a camera in my hand for, and 
the quality of the camera has got considerably better over time, but it's it's always been that for me. So what was it about sharks? What made you just decide that you went, right, I'm going to shoot shark? That, that. Was that something like Brian, where you'd seen something on TV and that inspired you, or what was it? Yeah, well, I, I've been in love with sharks since I was three. Uh, and then when I was about seven, I saw a documentary on TV called Realm of the Shark with uh, Ron and Valerie Taylor. And um, it was kind of a real sort of eye-opener for me because it was this the amazing footage and, and lots of sharks everywhere, which was, of course made me interested. But I realized then, okay, you can actually have a job where you get paid to travel around the world and film sharks and do cool, exciting things and have adventures. So it was a case of seeing that and just being, like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. I never really went down the route of um, ever thinking it wasn't going to happen at some point. So it was just from being a kid, it was all about career, career, career. Um, so in terms of hobbies and interests, they've always been things that I've been passionate about. It's been something I actually wanted to make a career out of because I didn't want to get stuck in an office job or spending every day going doing something I didn't want to do. Um, so it, it took a long time to get there, but I got there in the end. Hmm, there you go. So, Brian, with you, obviously you started diving more the traditional route, that you actually got into it because you were inspired by Jacques Cousteau and the whole diving thing, and you went that way, and then you kind of went into the diving professional route as the instructor, etc. But what was it then? That, how did you get into the underwater filmmaking, videography side of things? Well, I'd, I'd always had a um, a passion for photography from you know a very young age. Um, m my grandparents gave me a camera when I was younger, um, a little Instamatic, and I was very much into steels. And um, I used to do chores for my grandparents in order to earn the money for the little Kodak films that went inside um, the camera. So I'd always I'd, I'd always had a uh, I suppose a background in in photography of a form um, and I turned professional I started working at uh, and art diving actually many moons ago um, as an instructor and also as a commercial diver attached to the commercial side of things um, and it sort of fell into the right place at the right time really there was a, a job that was happening and someone needed some footage taken of it and there was a camera pretty much handed to me of, can you do that? And it was like, wow, that was good. That was fun. You know, taking something down a, and a little sealed tube, um, point and shoot, and then hand it back over at the end of it. So that was, that was pretty much how, how I got started in it. I think I must've been about 24, 25. Okay. And you got into that. Now, as Dave was saying as well, equipment's changed a lot over the years. So what equipment do you guys tend to shoot with? Or does it differ on the job? Does it depend what you're planning to shoot for, et cetera, et cetera? So different. It's so different. You know, so um, you see here, so this this takes um, one of these, which is a, an HD Sony camera. You know, it's not 4K. It's a bog standard HD one, which is more of the in-house run and gun sort of like camera, which is for, you know, for, for fun and giggles. Um, there's, you know, if you want to go out and do any job, it's dependent on what the work is. You could be requirement of shooting in um, ultra high definition. It could be something like an Alexa or a, a red camera system. It could be in scuba bags. It could be completely submerged. It's all dependent on what the job is, really. So, in Personally, for, for me and, and what I do, I have a bog standard steels camera and a Sony camera that fits inside the gates, which is in-house. And then anything else beyond that, then we simply hire in from one of the hire houses. And it's really good business sense to do it that way, because otherwise you're forever buying cameras and then trying to get rid of them at a later date because... You know, within a couple of years, your camera's pretty much gone out of date. It's defunct. They bought out another camera that does more or is higher definition. You know, it, it wasn't, I think it was back 2011, 2012, full HD was all the rave. And then it was 2K, then it was 4K, and, you know, 6K came out as a, as a bit of a thing, and 8K cameras now. And so you could be 
chucking money after uh, cameras really at a professional level. Um, recreationally, one of these. It's amazing what an image you can get from a from a GoPro. You know, and a lot of recreational divers are using GoPros or Paralens. Um, so uh, for for fun and and just you know shooting shooting your own stuff when you go scuba diving, then um, it's amazing that you don't have to spend that much money. But certainly, you know, broadcast end, you could be spending, you could investing in tens of thousands of pounds on cameras. Yeah, I can imagine. So, Dave, what sort of stuff have you used? Uh, I'm a little bit different in that I, uh, I I took the plunge and went down the, res uh, the result of making the big investment. So I'm using a Panasonic EVA-1. Uh, it's a 5.7K cinema camera. And the, I've, I've been wanting to upgrade for years and years. Prior to that, I was on the Canon 7D, uh, the Canon 7D DSLR. So during the whole DSLR revolution, shooting HD, but it had so many limitations that I've been looking for years to upgrade. And then Panasonic, kind of without realizing it, um, brought out the perfect underwater camera because there was a big gap between the DSLR prosumer market and then the red and the Ari up at like 50, 60, 70 grand for your setup. So um, Panasonic kind of filled that gap. So it gives me the opportunity to shoot 4K, 2K, high frame rates, raw in two different formats. Um, I never really shoot uh, anything below 4K. Sometimes I will shoot 2K uh, if I need higher frame rates, like 240 frames a second. But um, it gives me a flexibility in the Panasonic kind of color science of it. Um, it means it's just a superb camera to shoot underwater with. So um, I agree with Brian in the sense that when you get into investing, you're always concerned that, all right, I'm going to need to buy another camera again in two or three years. And it's not just the camera, it's the housing. Um, but with the setup that I've got with the EVA1, I pair it with the Shogun Inferno uh, external recorder and monitor uh, in that housing. I can't see myself changing for seven eight years uh just because it's i'm kind of future proofing it because i do a lot of stuff in post as well um i'll either edit and color a lot of my own stuff but if i'm handing it over to uh, a director on somebody uh, with somebody else's stuff they'll often come back to me with it anyway and ask me to color it so i know that when i'm shooting i know what i'm shooting for at the back end of it so that i can actually get the best out of that camera so it made sense for me to invest in something and plus you're balancing your weighing it out with uh, you can charge a lower day rate and then the production company will then take the cost of hiring in a camera externally or you can make the investment in your own kit. You charge for the kit on top of what you're doing and then you kind of recoup that. Uh, and that's the, the, the route that I went down. And plus the other benefit of that as well is I know that camera inside out. I know for a fact if I've got that camera in my hand, I know how to use it. I know that if there's a big raging current, there's sharks everywhere, something needs changing. I know I can change it in four or five seconds flat. Whereas if it's something hired in, I'll know my way around it, but I'm not going to be as comfortable in terms of muscle memory as I am with my own camera. Uh, and I think a lot of my clients see that as a, as, as a benefit. They know what they're getting, basically. So it was a big investment, which I'm still paying off. Um, but it was an investment that is definitely, definitely worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know from when we travel with you to Ackerbury in Jordan, and then I've been uh, to various places around the UK with Brian, You, this is the one thing I've noticed with videography. I mean, with still photography is one thing. You've got the camera, the housing, the arms, the strobes. So it's still quite, you know, labour intensive, but it, that's it. But you guys have <laughs> so much kit. It's <clears throat> so what... What is it like for trying to travel around and how do you work out what you're going to take and what not? Because you can't always take a van load, which is what you know you guys seem to have all the time. Yes, you can. It's awful. <laughs> I hate traveling with it. I love the destination. I just hate the traveling. But um, it, I'll take, on average, about 100 kilos with me. And that's two Pelican cases uh with the how that's just for the housing there's a housing laptop goes in there lights things like that then i've got a uh, camera bag then i've got all my dive gear and then clothing and toiletries are uh, the last thing that goes in so basically it's you put in as many clothes as you've left on your weight and you, you know 
as well from experience and traveling with me that I'm always overweighted as well. Um, and you, you often lose stuff through customs as well. The weirdest things, again, going back to Akaba, they took my, uh, my lens blower and my electrical tape. I'm not sure what they thought I was going to do with it, but they took that, which annoyed me, as you know. Um, but it's just, you just kind of accept that it's, you're, you're traveling with it. It's very, very heavy and you're paranoid the whole time that it, it, is it going to get to where you're going and is it all going to get there in one piece? And then you've got on top of that as well, like setting up the housing takes a long time. Setting up my housing for the camera will take me about an hour and a half just, just to build it, put it all together, get it all checked, get it all set up. And then you, you're carrying it around as well. And it's about 20 kilos. And I spend a lot of time in the tropics. So it's very hot, very humid. You're in a wetsuit. You're carrying 20 kilos worth of camera around at the front and about 30 kilos worth of dive gear around at the back. And you're in and out and in and out. You're running around. It's a 14, 16 hour day. Um, and people do still seem to think it's a holiday. <laughs> it's, it's definitely not. But it's, I wouldn't swap it for anything, but it's, it's manual labor. It's hard work. I mean, I always come back from a shoot and I've lost a good six, seven pounds easily if I'm in the tropics. Yeah, I can imagine. So were you, Brian, when you're doing your stuff, I know you've turned up um, when we went and did our UK trip and basically you had a Land Rover that was full to the brim with everything. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it, it it depends on on what you're doing because if you're if you're doing recreational stuff, it's it's quite simple really. You can pop along with your GoPro or you can take your your Nauticam housing with your DSLR in it. Um, but if it's a commercial shoot, then you're looking at your main camera, a backup camera, um, plus all your kit for your your team as well, comms. Um, it's it's not light. You know, you, you've you've got your your vac system to pull the housing down um, to pressure to make sure it won't. You know, your leak checker. Um, you've got weights for the camera system. You've got your lamps, charging units. Um, there's nothing worse than turning up to do a job and then all of a sudden realizing that something's broken or you've left something at home. So I work on the default of take everything, pretty much. Yeah, well, I could see that when you rocked up. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen so much kit in uh, in one place. Now, harking back to a couple of weeks ago when we were talking to Luke Inman, who's another videographer, and he's been involved in shoots for Blue Planet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, he said one of the main things to remember is if you're wanting to be working as a videographer or filmmaker is underwater, is not just be shooting underwater. You've also got to be good and capable of shooting on land as well because it's Absolutely. very rare if they want you that you're going to be one or the other do you follow that advice as well you guys absolutely um you know knowing how to frame up you know first of all it's like dave said you know you, you, you've got to understand how to use the camera um not all cameras are the same there are nuances menu systems that you might need to delve into when you're shooting um but pretty much knowing how to frame um, knowing how lighting works um, topside, it's pretty much similar underwater. I mean, the, the only reason that you don't need to sort of like use much grip equipment underwater is because you're weightless and you can move around. But, um, you know, topside, you need your camera, your tripod, know how to shoot, uh, know how to frame up um, and, and be good at what you do on land because when you get underwater, you're pretty much going to be diving and task loading as well um you know it, it, there's there's a lot of discussion around whether videography or photography is technical diving to a certain format because there is a technical aspect to what you're doing you're not just sat there on your backside on the on the sea floor you're trying to be neutrally buoyant you're trying to frame up the subject um you're, you're trying to keep the shot um so you know having that skill topside is is paramount really yeah, I get you. Do you agree with that, Dave? Yeah, I think you've got to... Uh, I think before you even consider taking a camera underwater, you've got to get good with the camera topside and then concentrate on your diving without a camera. And it's only when you've got both up to a standard that are 
very good that you then combine the two because I think it's not just about as well kind of I think there's this videography and the cinematography and that sounds I sounds a bit pretentious no no I'll say it out loud but I think it's it's also it's kind of practicing um how do you do something creative it's not just capturing an image it's how do you capture the image in a way which um, almost amplifies everything in a way you've got to think of the you know, the end viewer now whether whether you're an amateur and you're just going to uh, upload it to YouTube and share it with your friends or whether you're a professional and you're doing so on a big budget um, you need to be able to think about the end result think about the viewer experience and it's almost painting a picture picture where every frame is beautiful or or effective at least it's, it's all comes down to storytelling so it's you're not just looking um, down the lens, uh, through the lens of the camera, what you're seeing on the screen. You're also looking around you for, okay, how can I improve the image? Or what could potentially alter this image and move into shot that could change it dramatically and how you can be ready for that. So I know what I always try and do is try and be two, three steps ahead. And something that actually worked really, really well for me in terms of which helped hone my skills was uh, filming ballet. Uh, I did, bizarrely enough, a few years back, I had um, a few jobs where I was filming live ballet performances and I'd never seen the uh, uh, the performance or the choreography before. We turned up on, on the night of the last rehearsal and were expected to capture it uh, to then for them to then promote it for ticket sales. And you don't know the choreography and you're having to be one, two steps ahead, leaving space in the frame, watching how the dancers are moving and predicting where it is that they're going to go. And it's very, very similar to filming wildlife because you don't know what's going to happen with the wildlife either. So you can hone your skills that you use underwater topside. And and if you can't go underwater, just how to use light, how to use changes in light, how to use absence of light as well. Um, it, it, it all kind of ties in. And if you get good with your camera, topside where you you know where everything on that body that camera body is and how to use it you then when it comes to actually being underwater you're having to think less about the um the technical physical side of doing it and you can actually think more of the creative but then underwater you're also you've got to be in a position where you're not thinking too much about your diving it's kind of you, you're basically you're task loading yourself and trusting yourself to be able to do everything you need to do perfectly. Um, and, and it takes a lot of time to do that. So doing it on land where you're not having to worry about buoyancy, you're not having to worry about current, you're not having to worry about animals or other divers or bubbles or anything like that. It's a really good way to get good on land. And then when you go underwater, you'll almost regress back to not being that great anymore then get good underwater and then you kind of you'll you'll start to improve a lot but it's like anything the more you do it the better you get the more mistakes you make as well the better you get yeah yeah, yeah. no i get that now um you obviously you've both got thousands of dives under your belt um and you've obviously traveled around quite a bit so where are your favorite destinations for shooting video uh for me um i loved antigua when i was out there few years ago that was great um but being uh being a uk diver and an advocate of uk diving um i pretty much love the west country you know there's i i don't think there's anything better than than getting down to somewhere like swanage spending well you you know this we've been down to swanage together um you know hanging around under the pier on a good visibility day in the summer or going down to Kimmeridge, or going down to Newquay, down at the Gazels. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's. I, I just love UK UK diving. West Country is pretty much uh, the thing that does it for me. Cool, Dave. Whereabouts for you? Uh, Australia is my favourite place I've ever been. I think um, it's just wild it feels like proper diving it's just getting out to the dive sites is can be difficult enough and i i was there last year as cyclone oma hit uh and we still went out diving uh, and the good thing about that was there was nobody else out diving so we it the amazing thing is that you 
you're going out, you get underwater and it's blue water and it's there's so much life and it's so big and there's so much of it as well. And it, it can be so changeable. It's warm water one day uh, and then the next day it's dropped by about eight degrees and it changes the kind of animals that come in. But th this never seems to be a dull dive, uh, uh, certainly in my experience in Australia anyway. Um, Fiji for the sharks as well. Uh, obviously, Fiji's got such a special place in my heart. It's in terms of shark diving, there's nowhere else on the planet um, that, that can touch it. Um, love the Azores as well. Again, wild diving, uh, blue water, wild blue water diving. There's, there's so many places to choose from. I think Southern Red Sea is kind of my go-to place. If, uh, if I'm not on a job, for example, and someone's sending me somewhere else, um, then if I just want a, a good two weeks of solid, good quality diving with lots of life, it's Southern Red Sea is brilliant because it's, it's accessible. It's not that expensive uh, to get to. Diving's great, blue water. Um, I'm definitely, I'm a little bit different to Brian. I, I like the warm water. I like the tropics. I like hot, humid weather. Um, and I like lots of colourful things and, and lots of big, big things as well. Um, if you forced me to pick one, it'd be Australia though. Okay, well, that kind of also, that leads me on to the next question, was what's your favourite animals to shoot and why? Um, for me, uh, definitely sharks, obviously. Um, I think in terms of favourite sharks to shoot, uh, bull sharks are up there, definitely they're my favourite. Um, they've just got a charisma that no other animal I've ever come across has. It's just, charisma is the only word to put it, it it just flows out of them. When you see them, you know that they're there and they've got that presence about them. Uh, and they kind of over, I mean, you, you did the dive that, that, that I did, I mean, to uh, the, uh, obviously to a slightly lesser extent, but you still experience what it's like out there. Um, love bull sharks. I'm a really big fan of sand tigers as well. Um, did quite, uh, quite a bit of stuff with them out in Australia. Um, but they're big, but they're docile, they're a bit dopey. Um, but again, just the, the turn of speed and, and the size and the, the strength of them. Um, but I think, again, if you force me to choose one, bull sharks with oceanic white tips are very close second. When you get a performer, um, it's just they put on a bit of a show. And um, that's what I like. I like them to come as close as possible. I like to have as many of them as possible. And I like them to be as big as possible. Uh, so anything where anything like that, you can kind of rely on them that they're not going to be too shy. Uh, so anything that, that's got that confidence about it, um, I, I like. But for me, definitely, my number one is bull sharks for sure. Uh, for me, um, Porth Keris and cuttlefish breeding. That is a sight to behold. Um, basically, if you've ever been to Porth Keris um, before, it, you drop down in um, off the beach and about sort of like 15, 10, 15 metres, there's quite a large rock that comes up out um, of the seabed and certainly um, gets quite busy down there with with, uh, with cuttlefish um, when, they, when they're in uh, breeding season. And that is, that's quite amazing. Um, and they, to me, they're like little UFOs. Um, they're, they're, they're mesmerizing, absolutely mesmerizing. I, I think they're amazing animals. I was just going to say, Dave was talking about um, sharks and stuff having charisma, but I always am with you as, as well on that front. I mean, I love sharks, don't get me wrong, but octopus, cuttlefish, squid, they are one creature that when you're down there, they do seem to be actively looking back at you. Um, yeah. Whenever you see footage of octopus and stuff like that, it is it is mesmerising. Just they're uh, such an unusual uh, creature, um, and that's and there's something that um, again leads me on to my next thing is with film. What I like about film is it can capture the movement and motion of a creature that you can't get with a still. So particularly things like cuttlefish, as you said, they can go in all directions. The way that they can change their colour and everything, um, and so I think that's that's the winner that you've got on the filming side of it. Now, on the downside with film, rather than just having a single image, which you can then tweak in Photoshop afterwards, you end up with hours and hours and hours of footage. So how do you whittle that down into a half hour 
documentary or a 10 minute short or whatever what are your kind of you know tips and advice on how to shoot and tr with that in mind well um it, it shouldn't be <clears throat> excuse me it shouldn't be hours and hours of, of footage to trawl through to be fair um if you go into a dive location then it would have made sense to have researched the location prior to that to know what sort of marine life's there um and pretty much you know scribble out a, a storyboard to a certain degree um of what you're likely to see and if you do the sort of shots that you want to get together an overall um mood and feel for the for the little film that you want to make um that cuts out a lot of this hours and hours of trawling through footage to see what you've got um, or trying to find a particularly good part because you've left the camera on run for the whole of the for the on the whole of the dive um, which most people tend to make the mistake when they shoot with a GoPro um, you know they stack it on stick it on their helmet or on their hand and they turn it on and press record and and that's the last you know last thing that you do with it is it's that age-old every gopro film starts with someone's face and finishes with pretty much the same so i mean if, if you know where you're going to be diving you know what marine life's there draw out a little shot list you can stick it on a slate if you need to um and have an idea of the sort of shots that you want to get and it goes pretty much back to what we said earlier about you know practice topside so that if you had got something that's moving along quite slowly, such as a, um, a crab on the seabed, instead of just being static and, and letting it move away from you, well, think about going really slowly, keep, keeping your neutral buoyancy, tracking it along, keeping it within the screen, um, you know, using your, your, your rule of thirds, um, which are your lines that you get on the back of your monitors, um, keeping it framed up. I mean, there's so much you can do to avoid the the drudgery of trawling through your your memory cards yeah sounds good david any other tips to uh, to add on to that one uh i'm really really particular about how i organize everything so i think if you've got an option whereby like brian said if you've got a shot list or a storyboard that really 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 helps uh, if you don't have that being selective about what you shoot is important um, and that's something that you'll learn over time and i think with that thinking about wildlife you the better the understanding that you have of the animal that you're shooting the better the uh, you're going to be actually uh choosing what shots to take so you're not just firing everything off all the time uh, when it comes to actually organizing footage for me what i always do is i at the end of the day, every single day, doesn't matter how tired I am, I will go through everything I've shot that day and I will put it in a very specific uh, filing system so that I know that when I get home from the shoot, that when I actually pull the hard drive or hard drives up, because I always duplicate as well, um, I know that, okay, day one, this is where we went, this is what we saw, this is everything split up into particular animals, for example, it was a great day for turtles, I'll have day one, location, turtles. And then what I'll then do is I'll go through everything in each day. I'll then um, make a best clips folder that and organize everything into that so I've got my best clips. Then go into Premiere and make separate timelines, trim everything down. And it's very laborious. It does take time. Uh, and when you shoot a feature, that, to give you an example, when I did this for a Shark and Man, it took me eight months to do this. So there was that much footage. Um, and bull shark left to right bull shark right to left uh tiger shark close up things like that but when then it comes to the edit i know where everything is i know that if i think right i need a wide shot of the location with this in it i know exactly where to go it's going to give me the clips that i need to pull them out and then trim them to what i need in the edit so it's it depends on what you're doing really if you're doing something that you know that you're going to have the time to do it um making sure you do it properly is is so key that because after two three weeks of hard work when you get back you don't want to go through it all in one go and that takes me back to never ever ever give into the temptation of thinking i can't be bothered to to back up the footage tonight or log it i'll do it tomorrow because you'll feel exactly the same tomorrow 
but you'll just have two days worth to do. So it'll be even worse. So it's being kind of regimented. I'm very, very strict with myself in how I do it. And usually that comes at kind of midnight, one o'clock in the morning at the end of the day, but I force myself to do it. Um, so it's just making sure that I know where everything is and also that everything's backed up in duplicate, at least ideally in triplicate, which gets very expensive with the hard drives, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Brian, I think you have something you wanted to add. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's what Dave just said about, you know, commercial filming, absolutely. You know, it's you've got to cover your backside, back everything up, and trim everything down, make sure you've got what you need. I think more of a re recreational level, though, for, for your average um, scuba diving buddy pair that are going to go out um, for some fun, whether it be in the UK or um, shore diving or within a quarry um, or even, you know, on a on a liverboard or something like that for a holiday. I think the, the biggest thing that you can think about is, you know, do your background work on where you're going to, know what marine life's around at the time of the year um, and make sure that you, you, you either storyboard it or like David said, you know, um, be selective on what you shoot don't just um hose everything down with a camera lens um but most of all you know don't leave things like the card in the camera for any longer than you have to take the card out stick it in something like one of these a, a camera safe um and you know if you can copy it onto your computer before you leave the dive site um but don't delete the card and, and that way you know you're not going to lose your card you're not going to lose your shots You've got a, um, a backup of it if you've got access to a laptop or even a card copier. Um, so, you know, you, you can make life a little easier for yourself at recreational and fun level. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Um, right, bit of a fun one before we get on to uh, some of the questions because I can see them stacking up, which is good. Um, what is your most memorable diving moment? Shark uh, Reef in the arena, right at the edge. 100 bull sharks, um, me on my own, right in the middle of them as they're feeding on a big uh, load of tuna heads uh, in the reef and just having, I think it was about 20, 25 minutes, um, just seeing these bull sharks going absolutely nuts, bumping into me, um, just feeling the most alive I've ever felt in my entire life. It was the single most bizarre, incredible experience I've ever had without a doubt it's got to be that um for me filming my 12 year old son complete his final paddy open water dive um that sounds really boring but for me it was uh, i was I, I was extremely proud father that um a my son even decided to to um, take up diving and follow his old man. But um, yeah, for B, actually seeing him underwater, finishing off his final paddy and water dive and being able to film it, having nothing to do with the instructional team that, that taught him, um, but just capture the uh, capture the moment of him getting the high five on his last skill and then off for a bimble. So that for me is, is my most memorable out of all the things that I've done and places I've been to. That's the one that's um, got, a, got a big, big pride thing for me. Ah, yes, uh, like you said, proud dad moment, that, definitely. Um, right, so that was your most memorable, funniest diving moment. Ah. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know whether I could talk about them on here. We had this, cat, we had this chat today, mate. Um, uh, it'll probably have something to do with Paul Toomer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to. I'm not going to start causing trouble. <laughs> you can't leave people hanging. <laughs> oh God, David, go on. What was your one? Um, mine was probably. Uh, it was in Tenerife last year. I took my girlfriend. She's Karina. She's really, really keen to uh, to get her open water. She really, really wants to do it. And uh, we did a try. We'd done a try dive in a pool before. And we were all the day together and uh, she saw, I oh, really want to do one in the sea as well. So we went out into Tenerife, uh, in, uh, into the sea for a tri-dive in Tenerife. And she, 
she did really, really well. She took it, she took to it incredibly quickly and became pretty confident with what she was doing. So obviously I'm really, really proud of this and I'm filming and I think, gosh, she's doing even better than I thought. And the weird thing was she was stopping and the fish were coming up and just kissing her on the face. And like, obviously she's, she's, she's a novice diver. It's the first time in the sea diving with, with fish. Uh, and you're normally quite kind of ungainly and, and the fish don't want to come anywhere near you. But one in particular just wouldn't leave her alone, just kept coming up and just kissing her on the face, kissing her on the nose, kissing her on the regular. And I'm thinking, I've done, what, 1,500 dives, 13 years of diving. Never had that happen to me. She goes underwater on the first dive and that happens to her. It was just, it was just weird. It was really, it was like Little Mermaid. Um, so that was, uh, I've not had that many funny moments on dives, come to think of it, which is quite sad, really. But that one definitely does stick in my memory as being one that uh, I, I remember and just finding very amusingly weird. That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, right, let's uh, let's have some questions um, because we've got various one coming up. Uh, right, we've got, what's our first one? We've got Sebastian. Uh, how can I get involved to work as a shark photographer and filmmaker? Any advice or doors to knock? Um, with that one, it's a case of, it's, that's the job that everybody wants to do. It's a job that everybody wants to do. Um, so it's incredibly competitive and it's incredibly difficult. Um, Brian mentioned before about right place, right time. And, and that to a certain extent for sure. But the, the route that I took for me to go down that route was I knew that no one was going to offer me the opportunity. No one was just going to hand it to me on a plate. So I just went out and did it myself. And the idea that, that I had was, uh, I'm just going to go out and make a film. I'm going to make an ambitious, complex film and make it as creative as I possibly can um, to prove that I can do it and then keep going out and then keep doing it uh, with my own projects. And then that leads to then people uh, paying attention, taking note of what it is that you're doing uh, and then, then approaching you saying, ah, we'd like to have to pay you to do this um so it's i think sharks is the thing that everybody when they look at what they oh, I want to get into underwater cinematography um i'd like to to work with a particular animal it's sharks probably more often than not for most people um i also think understand sharks and get to understand and know what it's like to be around sharks and, and how sharks behave and how sharks behave as well when you're on uh, a dive, if you're going out with a normal dive operation to a dive site where they have sharks, seeing how they behave then is very different to seeing how they behave when it's you on your own in a position whereby you have to get the shot because they will behave very, very differently. Um, understanding how they behave and just going out and doing it, I think. Putting content online, you will meet people along the way and then you've got to hope that through tenacity and quality of work, that someone's going to give you a shot. If you get the shot, don't blow it. That's probably the best bit of advice I could give. <laughs> anything to add to that, Brian? Um, well, I, I think it's, it's with anything when you want to succeed. Um, pretty much know what your subject matter is um, and understand it and be persistent. You know, have that, like Dave said, have that tenacity to keep on going. Um, within it, it's weird at professional level within within this you know, within this industry you're you're becoming niche of a niche market you know you're you're being a niche um, operator within um, filming and then you're going into something which is really left field and concentrating on just purely sharks um, or, or any large predator to be fair uh, but you you've got to I think have a certain appetite for for risk, um, you need to be good at what you do. You need to be extremely skilled within your diving. Um, and I would probably suggest that you need to be thinking about being technically trained um, for rebreather uh, in order to cut down and minimize bubbles, um, which you know we now understand affects the marine life. I, mean, I remember the first time I went on rebreather filming um, and then pretty much came back to you know, off, off of um, off of open circuit. And I had all sorts of marine life coming up to me whilst they were filming. I, th I thought it was my birthday. But uh, I would say, you know, know, know what your subject matter is, be persistent, 
be good at what you do and don't take no for an answer. If, if I can add something as well, um, the the what probably the biggest difference between doing it on a professional basis and doing it on an amateur basis is when you're doing it something for yourself, it's um, you, there's, there's a lot less pressure on you uh, because you can, if you miss the shot, you're going to be annoyed with yourself, um, but it's only you that's annoyed. Um, if you miss the shot on a professional basis or or you, you, you make mistakes, and we all make mistakes. We've all hit, and Brian, I bet you've done this. We've filmed this incredible sequence where you go, oh, that's going to look amazing. And then you look down and you realise you didn't hit record. Because yeah, you looked at record me. Uh, yeah. And then you stopped. Um, yeah. We've all done it. We've all done it. When you're doing it on an amateur basis, when there's not that pressure on you, that's okay. If you're doing it on a professional basis, you're going to have somebody shouting at you. So there's a lot more kind of pressure for you to make sure that you're ready to perform at the highest level that you're capable of every single day, all the time. And somebody be saying, can you get this? Can you get that? Can you get this? And you will go out in, in, in conditions that other people won't go out in as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of um, challenge yourself as well, I think. Um, do things for yourself. Challenge yourself. Make yourself do things that you find difficult and make mistakes make all those mistakes while you're learning uh because that'll stand you in good stead where if you get the shot and you get the opportunity to actually do something on a professional basis um you'll have made so many mistakes you'll have learned everything not to do so you'll be uh reliable and professional as well when you're actually on a job and make the mistakes that are life-threatening make the mistakes with yes, the camera exactly. forget, yeah. forget your camera card at you know 27 meters um go to turn it on and realize that you can't actually start recording because it says no card in camera you know and then yes. go for a dive and enjoy it yeah yeah, yeah. i like you and that leads on this is a good question from brock have you ever had something happen on a dive that caused you to drop the camera to deal with an issue yep Yep, um, I was using a uh, a full face mask attached to the bob of my CCR, and I had a leak on the full face mask where the bob came through. Um, the zip tie had popped, and basically the camera was dropped. I thumbed the dive, and it was uh, ascend, uh, get back to the top in a safe and controlled manner. And it's like, well, you, you you drop the camera. I use lanyards on on my. I've got quick release lanyards um, for the simple reason that I don't want to drop, you know, sort of like ten or twenty, thirty grand's worth of camera and lose it. So um, yeah, cameras on a long lanyard between my legs, and I'm busy on my way back to the surface. So yes, I've made that call before. Yeah, I, uh, it's like it's your first one. I'm not going to let go of. <laughs> Mine's slightly different, yeah. I uh, and I've had uh, the, my nearest and dearest, like my mum uh, and uh, my girlfriend, both shouted at me for this. But um, I had a really, really bad thing in Egypt where I really could have died on that dive, and at no point did I think of dropping the camera, which is idiotic. <laughs> it's stupid, uh, and it, it's kind of, it's admitting a fault, I guess, as well, because it literally arrived. I'd only just got it. I'd had it for maybe two weeks at this point. And I'd had the, got the camera that I always wanted. I loved the setup. And things went very, very wrong, very, very quick. Um, and I had to do everything with one hand. At no point did it occur to me, drop it, you'll uh, you'll have a better chance of getting out of, it, out of it. Because I was pretty confident I could get out of it. And I don't recommend doing what I did to anyone. Drop the camera and just go. If you can replace the camera, it doesn't matter. But it just, I don't know what it was for me. It just, it never crossed my mind. I've got it in like a, I've got a, a lanyard around my wrist. But it's a very heavy camera as well. And I've got a vice-like grip on it at all times. It's just, it's, it's stupidity. It is absolute stupidity. But I'm being honest, <laughs> at least I guess. But yeah, I, 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 I think... I was going to say, I think the only yeah, reason the only why thing that's ever stood out to me has been the worst experience I've had underwater, and I didn't, yeah, I didn't drop it, which is very, I didn't think about dropping it. <laughs> I, I, th I think for me, the only reason why I, I dropped it that day is because I knew the lanyard was there, I knew it worked, and you know, I, I might have had a few more years of uh, of struggling than you might have had, David. And I've 
been down that path before, hence the reason long lanyards now come into play. Those coily ones that extend apart, that stretch right the way down so your fins can be clear and it's it's hanging down here somewhere. Well, I like it. It's, it's amazing the things that go through your mind because another thing is a, a little problem becomes a big problem very quickly in the world. Absolutely. Um, and it's... Um, and it's just having kind of the it's sort of having the wherewithal to problem solve with one hand. I think you get very very used to that. Having the wherewithal to problem solve maybe numerous problems at the same time with one hand. It's just I think it just becomes a habit. It's a very it's an odd thing that you you almost accept. I'm hamstrung in this position, um, and I know that I can get out of this. It's going to be a bit more of a struggle, but I can do it and get out of it and I'll still have the camera. And there's that kind of way of thinking. Um, but I don't ever recommend anybody do that. It's very much a kind of uh, do as I say, not as I do. So I'm being very hypocritical here. But um, yeah, <laughs> that's my yeah. answer. I like it. Uh, right, Jamie had a good question. At an amateur level of a GoPro, would you use filters or add colour back in when editing? That's it's... I learned something for an old BBC boy many years ago, um, and I'm going to sort of like uh, dress up the phrase now. It's not exactly what he said, but if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. Um, so if you can get the best possible image at the time of recording, um, then you will get the best possible image when it comes to the edit, uh, and then you can tweak colour, and, and Dave can tell you all about you know, crushing colours and grading um, because he's an absolute guru at it. But f for me, if if you can put colour back in filters in in um, salt water or the reds for the salt or, um, you know, the, the um, purple ones for, for green, great, wonderful. Um, not all the time. Sometimes, depending on how bad it is for me. But, yeah, I certainly use them. Um, I, I, do, I use filters. I use a filter on a GoPro. Um, I think if you if you've got a more uh, it sounds horrible to say, but a more professional setup, I'm, I'm a big believer in not putting as much in front of the lens as possible, keeping it stripped down as you can. Lights, a good set of lights, and again, the, the issue. I'm trying to offset my answer with, with understanding that underwater kit is just it's so expensive. Um, but if there's an opportunity to include light, so a, con a cons constant source of light um, uh, that goes alongside your housing, adding light and white balancing, you're going to get a better image. You're going to get a better image out of it. Um, there's ways in which you can shoot uh, whereby you can actually color, uh, where you can actually have the color back in in post. And, and I, I do that. I shoot in a log format. So for anyone that's not uh, aware of that, it's when you shoot in video footage which is um it looks very flat it looks very washed out yeah. no saturation no contrast it looks horrible to look at but what the camera's doing is it's retaining it's recording all the data and it's saying okay i'm recording the data but i'm not showing you the data so that when uh because i work as a digital colorist as well for uh theatrical releases for broadcast commercials things like that so i know that if i just record the data I know that I can then put it into my uh, software at home, which is Resolve 16 Studio, and I can bring it out, and I know that I can make real life look better. Uh, so it's basically, for me, if you've got the option to shoot in log and you have lights, forget filters. Um, if you have the option, if you don't have that option and you're shooting on an action camera, like a GoPro, for example, by all means, stick the filter on the front. Uh, if you can add light as well, even better. But colour comes from light. So the more light you have, yeah. the more colour you have. And so it's always better to try and retain the light as opposed to add it in through an unnatural source on camera because you're putting something in front of the lens and then you'll have a dome port as well. So no camera ever looks as good underwater as it does topside ever. So it's trying to minimise anything you're putting in front of that lens to degrade the image further. That's probably looking at it in a more professional sense. But on the GoPro, yeah, stick the red or the magenta filter on there for sure. Yeah, good advice. Good advice. Right, and that pretty much 
It's, that's the uh, that's our time up. Um, it was fantastic having you guys on. Hopefully, that's inspired a lot of people. Um, so, thanks. All I can say is thank you to uh, David and Brian. And uh, pleasure for having you on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Man. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Uh, and that's all we've got time for this evening. Uh, hopefully that was uh, educational and uh, a bit of fun for you. So next time you're out shooting, you can put some of those uh, tips into practice. Um, basically, just a final shout out to our uh, sponsors, Meflex Hoses. Like we said, add a bit of colour to your kit, stand out from the crowd. Uh, their shop's open now, so you can get your kit ready for when we can actually get out and go diving. Um, last thing to just say is we'll be back on Friday, the 5th of June, 3 o'clock British Standard Time. So join us then for another exciting live stream. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe.